You know, back in the day, and it's fine, back in the day in church, you used to hear a lot of fluttering of pages. Flutter, 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 flutter of pages. But now, now you just, I don't know if you're, I know right now you're not checking the football game scores. Because it's June. <laughs> but there will come a day where I'll never know. There'll be a random shout of joy, and it may or may not have been something that we said out loud in here. <laughs> there will be much more division and scowls and hard, hard words and harsh feelings in the house. You know, if, that's, if there's hard words and harsh feelings in the house, you know it's football season. <laughs> Got to pray for a lot of, of uh, conflict resolution. Especially here, we got, these, we got these Broncos and Seahawks people that just are, you need to drink decaf a little bit. <laughs> Go Cowboys. All right. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, baby. Let's get some sparkle. Yeah, babe. Have you found Matthew chapter 5? No. Matthew chapter 5. We are, at the, we are now going to conclude the section in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is teaching on real righteousness, that he began uh, in, verses, uh, in verse 17 of chapter 5. And just because we're wrapping this section up, let me try to wrap it up by actually referring to it or reading it. So this is, in verse 17, Jesus begins this section, or at least we understand Matthew as he is editing and, and putting all this text together. He has chosen to put the, these, the words of Jesus in this order for us. Where verse 17 says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So we're about to hear that Jesus is going to fulfill. He's going to reveal the meaning, the extent, the true nature of these commands. And then he says that none of these things are going to be, none of these things will pass away until they've been accomplished. They are accomplished in Christ. So then, uh, then in verse 20, he says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he is calling his disciples. That's the, when we're reading these words in red here in the Sermon on the Mount, he's, he's talking to his disciples, those who have followed him through into baptism and into the promise of the in vital contact with the Spirit. He's saying that his disciples must live in real righteousness, that there's a, there's a righteousness that he brings that is, that is real, that, it sur that surpasses. Then he gives examples, six of them, through chapter 5, from the law. He said, you've heard, it, you've heard this, and essentially the problem is you've been practicing it this way, but you have missed the full extent of it, and now I'm revealing this is real righteousness. Everybody feel me? Everybody got it? So, so he's gone through that, and he's gone through referencing a lot of, uh, from, the, from the Ten Commandments. Now he is uh, going to bring us to the, the last one. This last section uh, begins with verse 43. So let me read 43 through 48. That's our text this morning. It's one of the longer sections in the teaching. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Boy, I should have saved that for football season. So that, verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. I know you guys are all fascinated by that. Listen, listen, we all care about that baby. Everybody, you, everybody wants to look and see how beautiful that baby was. Aren't we glad babies are here? Don't ever let a parent feel self-conscious for bringing a baby. All you should say is, thank you for bringing them to church. Yeah. 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 Don't ever, I pray that this isn't one of those places that people go, mm-hmm. With the baby, you know, he's trying to talk. He's as distracted as you are, only he's just as jealous. But I don't have one of those. <laughs> let's, let's go back to the uh... but I say to you love your husbands I mean Sorry. 
but I, but I say, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Now, now that's a very important passage. Uh, Jesus hasn't hidden this idea yet, but Matthew is helping us to see that this idea, so that you'll be sons of your father, that Jesus pointing us toward our heavenly father becomes more and more important to help us understand who we are and how we should live. It's okay, I'll tell you. You don't have to shout yet. Just know that's where we're going. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. But if you, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? Now, we'll explain what Jesus meant by that. Your, your Bibles might say uh, publicans. And, that, and don't put a re in front of that and make it all upset. Well, see there, Jesus, Jesus, how that's how he wants us to vote right there. No, that, we'll talk about that. Uh, yeah. Verse 47, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Oh, therefore, you are to be perfect. Thank you. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow. Again, all of this, all of these instructions, all of this teaching is predicated or based upon the first introduction we have to Jesus. And that is that he is mightier, he is more powerful than John who baptized in water, that his ministry is more powerful than simply a, a ritual, but he is going to bring us into vital contact with the Spirit that will powerfully transform our lives. And because of that, we will live like this. That being brought into vital contact with the Spirit defines discipleship and determines it. If that sort of newer idea, come on back tonight. We'll wrestle through that a little bit more. But all of this, all of this is because of, is made possible and expected from us because we've been brought into vital contact with the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. Because of that, we are expected, we are enabled and expected to live in real righteousness. And this is this passage that teaches us about that. So the context of the uh, of, the, of today's example, verse 43, let's look at it that again. Here's the, the, new, the, new, uh, the new springboard. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. How many have heard that? Okay. Uh, and if you have, and your, your Bible might have those words capitalized, and that's because it's, it, that's a direct quote. And then, and uh, the next part, and hate your enemy. Well, let's take those one half at a time real quick. The first part you shall love your neighbor. Everybody say it out loud. You shall love your neighbor. Very good. That's from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Now it's elsewhere, but that's one of the, the in, 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 uh, in, that's one of, as they're circling around Sinai in the book of Exodus, this is where the book of Leviticus happens. And so this is the giving of the law. So here we have in the Levitical law, here's the command, verse 18 of 19, you shall not avenge or hold a grudge. Interestingly, Jesus just, uh, just talked about that in his commandments. You shall not avenge or hold a grudge, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then it's concluded by the phrase, I am the Lord. So, it's, so that commandment is connected to, to God, to our understanding of him. That's really, really important. So, so you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, I am the Lord. On its own, just all by itself, this command to love our neighbor as ourself, Jesus refers to it as the second greatest commandment. All by itself, it's a big deal. Go ahead and say it's a big deal. A on its own, it powerfully governs human behavior. It is a command to show love to your neighbor in a way that you yourself or we ourselves would want to be loved. 
It is not about having a feeling toward your neighbor, but about acting or doing or being good to your neighbor. Everybody say good. Luke 6, Luke 6, 31 uh, says, Jesus says this. this. We call this the golden rule. But Jesus says, treat others the way you want them to treat you. The focus or the emphasis is on what you're doing, how you're acting, not just how you are feeling. To love your neighbor is to treat them or act toward them with goodwill. But this is not complete. This is why that, that I am the Lord part was important. That this command is not complete without a divine locus, without, a, a, without it being theocentric, God-centered. Otherwise, the command to simply love people as you love yourself can become humanistic or egocentric and even carnal. For instance, I might say, well, I certainly don't want to tell them no because I don't want anybody to tell me no, you know. I don't want to, you know, it becomes whatever, whatever would please me or whatever would fit even my carnal instincts, I might treat others the same way. You see, it, anything, when you remove it from an awareness of who God is and his ways, anything can become a train wreck. Even this second commandment can become just total chaos. It can become willy-nilly, define it as you, as you will. But it's never introduced that way. It's introduced as, love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It, it's a command given in, the, in a theocentric, a God-centered context. This is important. Because this is not a command that is intended to deify our own ego. I'm to treat others in a way, the way I treat you is, is I do that in reverence to and in deference toward the will of God. Even later on, when Paul writes in, the, in, in Ephesians and he's talking to uh, family members and he says, submit to one another out of, out of reverence for Christ, Don't, it's not just submit to one another, but out of reverence for Christ. Our relationships with one another are to be governed by or influenced by our reverence for God. So because of that, out of reverence for God, I treat others the way I would hope to be treated in reverence for God. I, 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 I'm going to assume the best of your intentions, right? I'm not going to be suspicious or accusatory. Right? I'm going to assume the best until proven otherwise. Okay? I'm going to be positive. I'm going to treat you with love and honor and hope. I'm not going to micromanage you to my expectations. You know who the author of free will is? God. He has expectations, but he's not a micromanager. The more I try to micromanage you, the less like God I am. <laughs> Now, he'll hold you accountable for your decisions. Don't get, that, don't get him wrong. But you get to make them. But also, out of reverence for God and real love for you and the way I'd hope that you would treat me, I don't passively approve of your self-destructive patterns or attitudes. If you're, just, if you're acting in a way that I know because I love you too much that is destructive, I'm not going to say, well, to each his own. No, I'll do whatever I can to stand in the way between you and that truck coming at you. Now, the second part that Jesus references, you shall love your neighbor. In other words, they knew that, we got that, we shall love our neighbor. Now, we're a bunch of first century uh, folks in Palestine. We're all nodding our heads. Yep, we go, yep, you're right, Jesus. We should love our neighbor. We got that. And then he says the second part, and you shall hate your enemy. <laughs> that part does not exist in the Bible. This is Jesus, uh, this is a first century troll of his audience. He's trolling them just a little bit. Yeah, that part is not there. That part came out in, in some of the traditions of the elders and some of the rabbinical teaching that it came out, you should hate your neighbor. Whoa, what the, where did this come from? It's not in the Bible at all. It has to be extrapolated from different texts. You have to take this this thing and then add it to this thing and then get and, and then you get this and then based on your extrapolation especially if you don't happen to like your neighbors then you can use the bible to justify your evil behavior 
It's a good thing that nobody ever uses the Bible to justify bad behavior. Am I right? <laughs> I mean, who would do that? Uh, but for example, Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22, the psalmist in an act of worship and just bearing his soul before the Lord in, as an, as a, really as an expression of adoration, he says, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Now, it, this, this is not, a, this is not a, uh, a prescriptive passage. This is not a passage that is teaching us what to do. We are listening to the psalmist, and it's, and it's really like when Jesus said. You remember when Jesus said, hey, if you're going to follow me, you've got to hate your folks. Do you think Jesus wants anybody to hate their mama and daddy? Of course not. Okay, this, it's, a, it's a figure of speech, meaning in comparison to your loving devotion for Jesus, there can be no comparison to anybody else. And the psalmist is saying, I love you. I am so enamored with you. I am just honestly revolted by the unrighteousness around me. I hate them. And he's, it's an expression. I, and, and it's not an endorsement. It's an expression. So they say, well, God hates evil. We hate evil. Well, you know what? First of all, you know what? Uh, hatred is not evil. What? But I saw it on the hashtag that it is. There are things that God hates. God hates suffering. Evil, oppression, blasphemy, and you should too. Meaning, from the furnace of, there are things that boil up for the, from the furnace of God's holy affection that so violate his love for people that he responds with a visceral response. The problem, the problem is this. They, they understood, oh, I'm, because they said, oh, we're supposed to love our neighbor, the problem was they began to redefine neighbor or to define neighbor very, very carefully. Oh, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. I see, I see. Well, my neighbor is only an Israelite. According to them. Their neighbor were only Israelites. Therefore, they only had to love their Israelites. And they didn't have to love their oppressors or their, their Gentile neighbors or anyone that acted toward with them toward an ill will or anyone that they thought were unclean. Anything that was different from them, they gave this, this passage, they turned upside down to give them authorization to hate them. Especially if you're a first century Palestinian, you don't like the Romans very much. And so now you can say, I hate them and I have Bible for it. And Jesus says, no, you don't have Bible for it. It may indeed, it's human nature sometimes for us to just begin to detest that which is just too different. But that's not the intent of the law and that's not righteousness. So what's the correction? The correction then follows in verse 44 all the way through verse 47. The correction is echo when Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Everybody say that out loud. Now, now, what the, the law said, and, and Paul tells us this in Romans 13, verses 9 and 10. This is the thing that we've referred to. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And then the other commandments are summed up in this one decree. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. Love your Okay, so that's the law. Love your neighbor. Love does no wrong to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And they said, oh, great. We like that. Love our neighbor. But Jesus says, um, you've missed it. So he says, I tell you, love your enemy. So the correction to wrong and, sin, uh, to wrong and sinful treatment from, the, from unrighteous treatment from men, that correction is, not to, is to love them, not hate them. If people are behaving toward you unrighteously, immorally, unkindly, whatever, your, the correction that Jesus gives is love them. Now, here's where we, remember that this is what Jesus does. He gives us, he, he argues from the most extreme, and if he does that, it includes everything leading up to it. So here's the deal. They were living with love my enemy, I mean love my neighbor, but everybody, everybody outside this line is out of luck, Right? Jesus takes the line and pushes it all the way out here. Love your 
reach that way out there. Reach, love your enemy. And if I'm, if I'm to love even my enemy, then how many more people fit inside my squeeze? Everybody. So he, there is no one that gets to live outside the circle of your embrace. Love even your enemy. Wow. Having saved this part for last, this really is the most comprehensive governor of human interaction. This correction is the most influential, the most life-giving instructive. It calls you and I, the disciples of Jesus, to have a proactive approach to, toward all people. Initiating goodness. Oh, say it out loud. Say goodness. Initiating goodness, practicing that goodness, irrespective of the antecedent behavior. Irrespective. Regardless of how people are treating you or have initiated behavior toward you, you initiate goodness toward them. Welcome to following Jesus. Now there's a reason for that and a good reason and we'll hear it in just a minute. What does this mean though? What does Jesus mean? Love your enemies. This is important because of the, the fuzzification of the word love throughout every century and no, no less than today. That word love has become quite fuzzy, quite subjective, quite independently defined. But let's go ahead and define it by what Jesus said. In the Greek, many of us know the Greek has several different words for love. Jesus uses one very specific one. He doesn't use a love that is a, a familial love. That's not because the familial love is a lesser or a, a, a less cool type of love, but it just makes sense, okay? A familial love, come here, bud. This is my son, one of them. I have several, okay? This is my boy. I love him uniquely, specifically as a family man. Jesus did not tell me that I, that I must love my enemy or the person who acts toward me as an enemy in the same way that I would love Max. That's, all, that's patently ridiculous. Sit down. It's ridiculous. Because I have, I, have I have certain almost uncontrollable psychological, biological inclinations toward this boy. I love him. I love him and I can't even help it. No, no, I know you think I'm kidding, but I'm, that, there's a point there. I don't have to even try. I don't have to try to love Max. There's really nothing righteous about my love toward him. Now, it's good and it's kind and I should be a good daddy and all that. But I, you know what? And when I first met Mrs. Dab, it was all dopamine. That's, a, that's the chemical that you feel that makes you feel like you're falling in love. But that's just the chemical God put in you to make you stick with somebody, leave an impression. And boy, did she leave one. Hallelujah. She, she actually was kind of bossed. She kind of bossed me around a little bit, but I like that a little bit. And it kind of, that's, an, yeah. Someday we'll do one of them seminars and we'll tell stories. But just me, just me, I'll tell the stories. What I'm saying is that's a different kind of love, okay? Jesus is not, not saying that I should love my enemies the way I love her. I could lose my pastoral license. <laughs> Jesus uses the word agape. Now, many of you know that word, agape. And you think, oh, I know that word. That's unconditional one. Yeah, yeah, that means you love not because someone has initiated or caused that love. There's no biological reason. There's no psychological reason. There's no, there's no uh, romantic reason. There's no familial reason. What's the reason for agape love? Your decision. Jesus says, love your enemies with that love. Love your enemies with a love that requires you to choose to love them. Oh, now we're talking about righteousness. 
So this agape love, oh man, every time I talked about this when I was a youth pastor, Brian Salwasser and the kids were in the youth group, and every time I said this, they would break into song. So just know, I already know what you're, what you're thinking. It was indeed, this love is indeed more than a feeling. If you come second service, you'll hear it. Oh, those boys. This, this agape refers to good will. Not necessarily even to warm feelings. Meaning, <laughs> it is quite possible to feel very little, even to feel nothing, but to act with good will. That is love. This is Christian love. Now, he's not, of course, he's not belittling the love I would have for Max or for Laura or even my dear friends, but he's calling us to a whole new, different level of love. A love that doesn't even, even if I feel the opposite of love, if my feelings, if I feel hurt, if I feel frustrated, and that happens. If I feel genuinely angry, but I still act with genuine good will, this is the love that Jesus is prescribing. See, with this love, my feeling is not really relevant, and with this love, feeling isn't even sufficient. It's not sufficient <laughs> to say that we feel love. <laughs> oh, by, by the way, that that kind of makes that churchy expression. You know the one that you hear in the, around the water coolers at church? Well, you know, I love them, but, and then something totally else happens or says, well, I love you, but. Uh, if, if, that, if I love you, but is followed by something that lacks goodness, you're not exercising real love. Real love comes from God and is defined by him. Love is does good because it is influenced by, it comes from the goodness of God. Therefore, our love can, therefore we can love people in a way that acts to protect them and even correct them. <laughs> yeah, wait, you don't, don't just, don't correct people, just love them. I am loving them. I can, but not, out, I don't, I don't even, I don't, but not out of, we don't correct or challenge people out of a desire to hurt them or to harm them, but out of a desire to honor God. That's right. Our goodness toward others must have as its model and goal, the goodness of God. So Jesus' correction here is that his disciples love their enemies and, as, as, and, and do so with goodwill. Now, the King James, the King James text there has expanded. It uses a different historical text. And it says, love your enemies, bless those that curse you. Now, these are the, we find these phrases elsewhere in Scripture, so these, these aren't outside. But there's a, in this tradition, it, it expands that. What is love your enemies? And it helps us see that this is defined by action, and action that is, in fact, opposite to a negative initiation. So, Bless those who curse you. Someone comes at you with cursing, you reply with blessing. Do good. There it is. Somebody say do good. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for them that spitefully use you and persecute you. So this love is benevolent and it is good even to those who are otherwise toward you. And if it is good to those who are otherwise toward you, then it must it has to be good to everybody in the circle. The last part of the correction in our verse today says this. Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. This last statement focuses the first and enables the first. Meaning, prayer is the highest good you can do for anyone. Prayer is... Jesus believes that prayer is the highest good you can do for anyone. Prayer also is the best means of fostering 
godly love toward others. It is not possible for me to harbor an, uh, animosity, harshness of feeling, angry meditations toward Eric and pray for him, genuinely pray for him at the same time. I say genuinely pray for him because I can be mad at him and say, Lord, I pray that you get Eric. <laughs> Tell him he's wrong. <laughs> but, but no, no one prays like that. But, um, but prayer, when, prayer will help me. If I'm genuinely praying, prayer begins with asking the Lord, I'm, I'm, I have to see people from heaven's perspective. And even if he is behaving toward me in harsh and hard ways, the perspective of heaven will help me see something else that perhaps he's trapped behind enemy lines. Perhaps he is being harassed. Perhaps there is something darker behind that that is bothering him, and he actually needs freedom. And I can, and I can, and I can act toward him with compassion. I'm, I'm no longer afraid. I'm no longer, I'm no longer offended. It's very difficult. If this is, by the way, once again, if this is true for your enemy, you might try it on a spouse. <laughs> Maybe that person didn't marry you because they're actually out to get you. <laughs> it's not, they're not playing the long game of sabotage. <laughs> Jesus knows what happens to others and to us when we pray for them. Now, one more time, I just need every once in a while, because I'm a church boy, I just like to offer a, a, an occasional church boy correction to things. Is that okay? So this, this is not uh, telling people in that condescending tone, oh, I'm, I'll pray for you. Well, you know, I'm praying for you, but no, no. First of all, you're probably not. <laughs> One more thing about this from a grammatical standpoint is both of this, that to, when Jesus says to, to love and to pray, he is using the present imperative voice with a verb, which means that it is something that is talking about, something that is, that is happening now and ongoing. And it's, so this present imperative has, it carries the idea, this, that loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you this is, this, he's communicating urgency and constancy. Jesus believes it is urgent that we constantly love and pray for those who behave like an enemy toward us. And again, if it's true for those, then it's true for everybody all the way in. What's the reason for all of this? I realize it's 1027, but I, I think we're going to, I see my notes. I know how many few pages I have left. We're doing all right. What's the reason for all of this is verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Not that by doing this we earn sonship or achieve sonship, but that so that we prove it. Acting this way demonstrates that we belong to our heavenly Father. Why is that? Because he, and he tells us, how does God show his love, his agape? By being and doing good, regardless of people's resume or performance or their goodness. He causes the sun to shine on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Now, when I grew up, and I honestly grew up, honest to the Lord, honestly grew up in Vancouver, we would say, well, he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, and we thought that was a bad thing. We were tired of the rain, and we thought, well, bad things, ha bad things happen to everybody, we guess. 
But that's not what it means. If you're living in Palestine, you need you some rain. And Jesus says, saying that God in his goodness gives the very best sunlight and water. He gives goodness to those, whether they're just or unjust. He pours out his kindness, his goodwill. Regardless of how they deserve it, he is good. There's no question. There's no measure on the, the, the measure doesn't come on the receiving end. The condition comes from the giver. No. Parenthetically, friends, this is, a fun, this is fundamental to anyone who would ever hesitate to, and think whether you are good enough that he would be good to you or even good through you. Whether you've done enough for the Lord to, to use you to help somebody, oh boy. The, the minute you start second guessing yourself, you have taken your eyes off of the real condition. The real condition is his goodness and not yours. And one more thing. Listen to this. Think about this. God, the one who cannot abide sin, who hates sin, is still good to sinners. But this is not an endorsement of sin. He will still hold sinners accountable for sin. And his goodness, as we, as we if you, when you read in the book of Acts and you hear apostolic preaching, his goodness actually is a witness against sin. Drawing people to that, revealing himself in the midst of their darkness, he remains light. So he calls us effectively to be like God. To, be, to act like our Heavenly Father. We see this is in verse 46 and 47. He says, For if you love those who love you, what reward is there? Don't tax collectors do that. Uh, so again, we see that right, the, the idea is that righteousness does, does not reflect the world around it. It initiates toward that world. This is the second time Matthew has used the word reward, and he will use it more often throughout uh, chapter 6. In other words, it, this, use, this idea that there is reward. Someone say there is reward. Ooh, say it better. There is reward. That is intended to actually be a motive for your action and goodwill toward others. There is reward for it. When it feels unnatural to do good, when it feels uncomfortable to do good, when, it, when your goodness goes unrequited by others, it will not go unrewarded by heaven. Heaven records, heaven rewards. There is reward for the life of love. There is. And moreover, the point is this. The disciple is supposed to be different. We're supposed to be extraordinary. How you love and the, the, how you are good to those who are in particular not good to you is supposed to make you different from the world around you. Anybody can be good to those who are good to them. Jesus says nobody is going to get a brownie button for that. He says even the tax collectors do that. Now in that day, the publicans, the tax collectors were people who were, these were Jewish citizens who worked for the, under the employment of Rome and they often collected too many taxes. They were oppressive. They took bribes and they were, they were counted. People thought of them as enemies. You see what Jesus did there? He poked them. You, they believed they should hate their enemies. He said, but you're, you're acting just like them. Youch, Jesus. Then he says, if you greet only those who greet you. What is the word greet? Does he mean, you, you, <laughs> he's saying more than just saying, hello. Uh, uh, this is a greeting that expresses a desire for the welfare of others. It, yeah, it salute to someone, treat them with respect, to honor them, to bless them, to smile at them, to show regard for them. The rabbis taught that they, we are to receive every person cheerfully. You are to bless them with your face first. <laughs> Regardless of relationship or perceived benefit, we are to show people kindness. This, again, but the, 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 the point is distinction. He says, even the Gentiles greet those who greet you. Even the Gentiles are kind to people. But your goodness must make you different. Because righteousness is goodness. 
Righteousness is imitating God, and God is good. And that's the verse, that would, brings us to verse 48 today. He says, therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So he's telling us, he's actually revealing something to us again about our Heavenly Father. He's letting us know how good God is and how good God is toward us. And as such, this becomes an inspiration for us. It's an invitation to imitate our Heavenly Father. And yes, it's an echo of Leviticus 19.2 where the first command was where God says, Be, you shall be holy for I the Lord am holy. He has always called on his people to imitate him. That his character is the model and, be, and, and map for ours. There's no question of what Jesus means here. This connects him this to, all the way back to 520 about, about righteousness that surpasses the scribes and Pharisees. Meaning what? To, the, to his audience, the scribes and the Pharisees were not the, the model, the goal of their righteousness. Who is? Right. He says, your heavenly father is now the model and the goal for righteousness. Wow. And then what's that look like? It looks exactly like what he said in verses 46 and 47. He causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on even those who couldn't care less. He, he, he is the ultimate expression of good will. Righteousness is goodness because righteousness is imitating God. And that is real righteousness. And that is what it means to follow Jesus. Let's pray. The challenge this morning is for us to, to imitate our Heavenly Father by practicing goodness and goodwill toward others. That challenge has been made and I, and I trust by the power of the Spirit it has landed in your hearts. But I can't let you go this morning. Mrs. Dav did a, just a wonderful job sensing God's heart this morning in, as we led in song. But I can't let you leave this morning without this challenge. Friend, please do not live your life worrying about God's goodwill toward you. Please do not live your life measuring your own worth, bargaining with God, hoping to hide certain things, hoping to dress up certain parts of your life in, in hopes that somehow he might, you might find favor, you might find something, he might be good to you. Friend, I pray for you this morning that you will just surrender to this truth that God is good because he is good. That God will do good and be good towards you because he is good. No, of course I'm not saying he is, that, he, that he just overlooks and winks at our sin. No, no, no. He's going to hold us accountable and the only hope for your sin is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. But even that, specifically that, friend, God so loved you first and foremost most that he gave his son. Paul tells us that while, while we were yet sinners, while we were still yet committed to being sinners, he sent his son to die for our sin. He did not wait for you to ask first. He did not wait for you to earn it or deserve it. He sent Christ to die for your sin, to save you from your sin. And Paul says, if God gave us his son, will he not with him freely give Give us all things. I'm convinced that if you could see in your heart just how good God is, intentionally, because he chooses to be, it'll encourage you, it'll liberate you, it'll set you free, it'll give you confidence to draw near to him, confidence to, to ask from him, confidence to step out and be used by him. God is so good. Hey, I know you're, I don't know what, you're probably going to sing that righteousness song. Switch it to something that, that C, no, say, go to God is so good. That's in G or C or D or something. 
And make sure we don't sing it like a marijuana tempo. You got it? Let's stand and sing, God is so good. Sing it with a little bit of joy, all right? God is so good. Is so good.